Maddie, I'm looking so forward to our discussion. I was just saying to you before we started rolling the cameras that I have interviewed a few people about longevity, but it's all been males. So I'm so happy that to interview you. That when you, you know, when your the request came through from I think your PR company, I thought I have to interview this lady because we've got to hear the truth. You know, hear more about women and and longevity and aging, and hear it from. And you've been in this field forty almost forty plus years. Same time as I, more or less the same amount of time I've been in my field. So we've both been in our fields quite a, quite a few years. So welcome. And I'm really looking forward to diving into the subject of longevity, specifically from a, from a woman's perspective. Well, thank you. And it's such an honor to be here with you. And yeah, we, we're both pioneers. We've been doing this aging, longevity, mental health beat for <laughs> close to 40 years. A and long time. That- it's a long time, and which is great because we've yeah. grown up as yeah. the subject has really gained traction. So that's pretty exciting. It's very exciting. It's very exciting. So tell t- tell my viewers and and listeners a little bit about who you are, what you do, your background. You know, I've looked to your you know the, the book that you sent and everything. So I'm very excited. But let them hear from you. Yeah. Well, as I just mentioned, I've been doing this. I'm on the beat for more than forty years. Well, almost forty years. So that means that when I started, I was in my 30s, and now I'm 74 years old, just at my my 74th birthday. Oh, congratulations. uh, Thank you. Thank you. And I'm co-founder of Age Wave. We're a think tank focused specifically on aging, longevity, and retirement. And we dig deep into the subject, doing all kinds of research and other kinds of projects. We do a lot of keynote speaking. But mostly what I, we've had the great opportunity to do along the way is to interact with other scientists, researchers, academics who are digging deep themselves. They're sort of giving us their insider view of aging and longevity as we're beginning to move into this beginning stages of a longevity revolution. And we really are. And what I find particularly exciting is that we women, we ought to be pioneering, leading the way, because we live on average six years longer than men. And that's great news, but there is a dark side to it. And the dark side is that even when you correct for longevity, women, we women, there is this health gap between women and men. Women just aren't doing as well in terms of our health spans as we are in terms of our lifespan. And that's something that's we need so to correct. interesting. Well, let's yeah, talk about that. By the way, brain span as well. Sorry, say that again? Uh, it's not just health spans, but our brain spans. Women, All for instance, are twice as likely to get Alzheimer's disease as men. Now, these are, these, I've interviewed a couple of people about Lisa Moskowitz. You must know her as well about of the course. Alzheimer's and and uh, longevity and women and things. So let, let's dive in. Let's take it. We know that for years, research has been biased towards men. And, you know, it's very new and recent that there's been so many women research done on women. And so you've really focused on women and longevity and how can one increase, use those extra six years or even extend that, as you said, not just longevity, not just lifespan, but health span and brain health. These are major factors. Can you talk a little bit deeper about that? Yeah. First, keep in mind that it wasn't until very recently that we knew that we could really take control of our health and our well-being. Scientists used to tell us that, hey, you know what? It's all about your genes. So Exactly. What are you going to do about it? But no, that's not the case anymore. In fact, it's been reversed. Research out of Calico Labs, which is part of Google's longevity. They're they're doing their longevity science there. They showed that up to 90, 90 percent of our health and well-being is within our control. Absolutely. I totally agree. My research and our team have found that as well with telomeres and and there's so much research coming out that it is that we we don't just have to submit to this genetic, so-called genetic bias, which is incorrect. We have so much more control than we realize. That's right. So that is such great news because that puts us into control. And I love the idea, but there's been this assumption sort of baked into it that mm-hmm. women and men are kind of the same when it comes to longevity. And that's just not the case, as you probably know all too well. Yeah, absolutely. So can you just tell us a little bit more about what some of those differences are? I know it's a huge thing, a huge question, 
but maybe from a top-down view, give us a broad overview of that. What when you say it's women and men are so different when it comes to research, what does that mean? What does that look yeah. like in your field specifically? Okay, well, let me give you a few examples. One that I'm I was blown away by when I heard it, and that is that it wasn't until the year 2016. Now that's pretty recent history. Yeah. 2016, that the FDA told pharmaceutical companies that they needed to include at least some women in their clinical trials. Oh, that's now, scary. That is really scary. So I'll give you an example. Me, I am use myself as a guinea pig when it comes yeah. to longevity stuff, as you might do as well. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, we're the best, right? Absolutely. Well, you look amazing. So whatever you're doing is working. So well, like <laughs> you do also. So that's, thank you. Yeah. So whatever you're doing is amazing. So Thank anyway, you. so the, the sad truth is that we have all these longevity hackers, biohackers who yeah. are using things like metformin, which is a pharmaceutical product that's been around for a lot, for decades, literally. And they use it as a longevity hack. And I went to my doctor and I said, can I use this? And mm. she said to me, well, I don't I don't know if I would recommend it, but if you want to give it a try, go ahead and let's just do blood tests on a monthly basis. Let's be really vigilant about it. Well, I started taking metformin. I took it for literally five days and I got so sick. Wow. I got such bad gut health. And of course, we know that the gut and the brain are all Turkey. connected. Mm -hmm. And that scared me to death. I immediately stopped, but it did take me weeks to get back my gut health. Oh my gosh. So in five days, it got wrecked. And, exactly. And, and you that's, see so, one. that's one example. You see so many of these longevity experts, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you, that are recommending metformin. And it's males that are recommending metformin, well, that I've seen. I, I, I stand corrected if there's females as well, but I've seen mainly males recommending metformin that's right. for longevity. That's right. So I would not recommend that. Let me give you another example. Intermittent fasting. I had the great honor of I love Dr. Walter Longo. He's the pioneer, yeah. as you know, behind intermittent fasting, came up with the whole concept, was involved with Dr. Roy Walford originally on the whole caloric restriction thing and realized, well, we can't starve ourselves to death. That's not so good exactly. for your health either. No, no. <laughs> they so he not. came up with the idea of intermittent fasting. And he was really, really concerned, especially for women, that people, that the biohackers were taking it to extremes, going for 16, 18 hours without eating. And he thought that window was way too extreme. And yeah. said, bad for your health, not good for your health. And he suggested that it ought to be 12 to 13 hours, especially for women. And I thought, wow, that's remarkably easy. I mean, you stop yeah. eating dinner at, let's say, 8 o'clock. Don't eat breakfast until 8 o'clock the next morning. You've Voila, done it without even fasting. <laughs> yeah. And you're not even affected by it. So what you're saying, if I'm hearing you correctly, is that these su suggestions have been based on the, on, you know, what a male needs versus what a female needs in the assumption. And that's basically how all, even, you know, we know that for people that have cardiovascular issues and it's quite, it, it goes across all of everything that there's been these assumptions so that new research has to be done and is being done. Thank goodness. Finally on women. So let's dive more into. Well, okay, can you give another, maybe an example more specifically of the sort of research that was done in longevity and, and males and females? Can you like maybe well, talk honestly, about Honestly, this is like very new. This is the new okay. longevity is looking at women and longevity rather than just making generalizations based on studying of men. So that by itself is interesting. So recently we've Definitely. seen, a, yeah, exactly. It's kind of crazy. We saw a study come out in the last few months that talked about exercise, which is not so sexy because we all know that exercise is great for longevity. Yeah, we've known it for a while. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's a silver bullet. Let's be honest about it. But what they have determined is that for women, doing exercise is far more effective as a tool for longevity than it is for men. And so, hey, that's wow. pretty good news. I like hearing good news for women. Yeah, that's wonderful. That's amazing. I love that. I really love that. Um, okay, let's get into some specific. What? So what inspired you? Well, I, I think I know already what inspired you, but specifically to write Ageless Aging, was it to, to get this into the hands of women? 
specifically? And you know, what is, tell us about the, how you've approached this book and why you wrote the book. Yeah, well, there's a, more than one reason. There's about three reasons. So Great. first, uh, I started Age Wave with my husband, Ken, uh, when we were literally in our 30s. And so along the way, wow. I've gotten to age as well. So I got to experience my own aging. And what I realized is yeah. that there's some really positive things about aging and nobody's talking about them. Mm. Uh, for instance, we gain a sense of resilience. Uh, maybe if we're lucky, a little bit of wisdom, certainly a lot of experience. And I wanted to take out my megaphone and let the world know, hey, this whole aging narrative it's wrong. It's We're telling mm. people that aging is a bad thing. I know, like it's an illness or something terrible. Exactly. It's a great thing. I mean, we we want to embrace our the positive side of aging. On the other hand, that. what I noticed in my own body was that there's a certain amount of decline that can happen if you don't pay attention to it. And when I did research, talk to other scientists, other researchers and academicians, what I saw was that there were literally steps we could take to either prevent or certainly delay some of the onset of physical decline that happens with age. So, you know, there's chronologic aging. I mean, yes, the number of birthdays we have. It's going to uh, happen. Have, yeah, it's going to happen. <laughs> I mean, yay, that's good news. I mean, the alternative is not such good news. Exactly. But there's that psychological aging, which we talked about as being positive aging. Mm -hmm. And then there's the physical aging, the bad stuff that happens. Mm -hmm. that maybe we lose muscle mass. In fact, we do. We start losing muscle mass about the age of 40. So these things really concern me. And when they concern me for myself, I realize, wow, there are millions and millions of women in their 40s, 50s, 60s, and beyond who are starting to cope with maybe they have arthritis or mm. maybe they have a chronic disease. Maybe they're coping with cancer or maybe heart disease or whatever they're dealing with to know that there are steps that they can take that can make their life, they can live better longer. That's and amazing. I wanted to be able to give get that message out to a lot of people. So the third reason had to do with my own health and well-being. Uh, when I was about five years ago, I started experiencing tremendous pain in my hips. And mm. I'm a big exerciser and I would like work through it. I mean, yeah, what we do, you know, yeah. but I was, I literally started walking with a limp and oh, finally, I would know it was terrible. I mean, I was in really tremendous pain. I'm sorry to hear that. To the, yeah, it was awful. So I went to my doctor and, uh, took an MRI and he came back, sat me down, like literally took my hand in his and said, okay, so this is going to be hard for you to hear, but you are bone on bone in both of your hips. You have hip dysplasia. You were born with it. Now, Gosh. today we do something about that with little babies, but now you were born such a long time ago. Gosh. Man, we just weren't doing those kinds of things. So you need to get hip surgery. And I asked him, what would you do if you were me? He goes, yeah. well, I go to somebody who does double hip surgery so you can do it all at once. And ultimately I did that. But this guy was so busy that it was it going to, to be wait. Yeah, I mm -hmm. had to wait. So I started doing some homework myself on how I could get rid of the pain. And, you know, I spoke to people like Mark Hyman and Andy, while I really tried mm. to get to the bottom of what I could do. And what I realized was I needed to start an anti-inflammatory diet. And I did. I mean, I cut out gluten, dairy, and most sugar. I also started meditating. I started giving myself positive affirmations. And I know this sounds crazy, but within mm -hmm. a matter of six weeks, all the pain in my hips went away. Wow, that's amazing. So did you still have the surgery? I still have the surgery. But I you could but the well. pain. But the pain with the yeah, so the pain, yeah, that's great. So that's I'm so glad you said that because you know the in the work that I do is mind management and I've shown with my work and our research and we just actually had a pay, another public paper published a few days ago 
that it does take at least nine weeks to for your mind to actually have that impact on it's, a, it's changing your body and brain all the time, but that's over right. to, to create a habit is actually going to take that six to nine, well, at least nine weeks. So that's amazing that you should say that. Yeah, that's, mine, that's mine quick, so. rather quick. I was lucky. The interesting thing is that the, the surgeon told me, okay, you're going to be in the hospital a week, and then it'll probably take you a month to be walking with no assistance. So I was in the hospital one night. Wow. And I was... L- literally walking without any assistance in two days. Fair enough. I was looking like a little bit like a duck, walking with my legs out a little, but I was able to get around without any assistance. And, you know, here I am five years later, and I am a huge advocate of this body, mind, health connection. Because, by the way, and I also, I gave affirmations to what the nurses who were in the surgical space and to the physicians and anesthesiologists, I was kind of embarrassed. It's like, oh, this is like such a weird thing to do. But they went, oh, no, no, this is great. Oh, uh, they were wonderful. very cooperative. So I would urge anyone who has any kind of a health issue to talk to their doctor and really get them involved in some of these affirmations. Well, that's really fantastic. Well, that's what I'm so glad people are listening to you on this podcast because this whole podcast is about understanding mind and the power of the mind and how the mind influences our psychoneurobiology. So it's fantastic that you spoke about that. So I wanted to ask some specific, some specific, oh, sorry, specific questions. You look at, uh, can you give us some practical strategies or mindsets individuals can adopt to embrace aging with vitality and purpose? Well, the most obvious one that I could come up with is this whole idea of what is our attitude about our own aging and the aging of other people. And I think that ageism is kind of the last ism that's acceptable. I mean, it's so embedded in our society that we, I know, it's just like we think getting old is not good news. But in fact, those people, there's been studies Mm. that show that if you have a positive attitude about your own aging and the aging of those people around you, you can add seven to 10 years to your life. Now, it's I mean, crazy. I know that I've read those studies. It's just, that's why I wanted to ask you that question. So have you found that with your research as well? That same, that, that the attitude to aging plays such an enormous role. I, I definitely have. And one of the interesting things that I found was through my research, that it's younger people, not older people, who are the most frightened about aging. And I think, you know what, Mm. that's our fault as older adult fault. We're not giving them positive role models the way we ought to be. Although we're starting to see some like Dolly Parton, super cool at 78, getting out in her little cheerleading outfit at a football Exactly. Yeah, I know, it's amazing. Yeah. No, no, it's amazing to actually have those positive attitudes. And then, okay, well then, any, any other, any other strategies that you well, can? Sure. There's absolutely a lot of them. A okay. Lot so of let's them... talk about those. Let's move into strategies now, because I think that you've given a lovely broad overview of um, the landscape and the reason you wrote the book. And so what can people, what can people do? And, well, and how do we change no... ageism? You know, how do we, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. So let's okay. take it, you know, what can we do? What can, how do we change it from young? How do we, if you, whatever age you're at, what can you do in terms of ages? And what would you recommend as a great starting point? How should we start doing something about this? Okay. Well, first, and I kind of mentioned this earlier, I think we need to embrace the positive side of aging. Now, it's not just having a positive attitude, but looking around and recognizing, yeah, look at what I've gained as I've gotten older. I've gained a sense of resilience. I've gained a sense of wisdom I and, and perspective. And one of the interesting things as we get older is that we recognize the fact that, yeah, I have more empathy and more kindness towards other people. And that level of kindness, believe it or not, it has an impact on our longevity. So I wow. think that's amazing. That's uh, beautiful. Kindness, yeah. empathy, attitude, but the kindness that is, has a huge impact on empathy. That's amazing. I yes, but there's some other things that are we don't think of all the time. So we know that we can do things with our diet and we can talk more specifically if you'd like, but you know, cutting out the bad, adding in the good, you know, that's I think six, intermittent fasting. Yeah. There's using food as medicine and 
if you do have a chronic disease. There's definitely specifics we can do there. But what about the things that we don't think mm-hmm. about all the time? Uh, now, there's more and more talk about sleep, but Mm -hmm. From the sleep scientists that I spoke to, they told us, well, it's not really sleep science anymore. We're talking about it in terms of circadian rhythm Rhythm. science. Mm -hmm. And that just waking up in the morning and doing a sun salutation, and it doesn't have to be a physical yoga thing, although that only makes it better, but waking up with the sun, spending at least 10 minutes with that sun in your face and taking it all in. I don't know. There's just something magical about that, yes. but it affects your sleep at night. And sleep has definitely not been my superpower. So when I started doing that, I could not believe the difference it made in my sleep. And we know that sleep in terms of brain health is truly a superpower. I mean, it really gives you the, it helps build consolidate memories, as you know very mm-hmm. well. And it also clears out that microglia debris that seems to build up. And that's kind of like gives your body the chance to take out the trash. Yeah, it does. Well. It definitely does. That's true. And you're saying about the sun. It's so true because we, when we're in Miami, I always keep better in Miami than I do in Dallas because we're inside more in Dallas. Whereas in Miami, we we, we um, have so much sun and we do yoga on the beach first thing in the morning, like yeah. the sunrise yoga and There's something about that in the days we don't, and I'm on the balcony having my coffee first thing in the morning, watching the sunrise. There is a difference definitely to have how you, and not everyone's got sun all the time. So, you know, that's obviously, but it's that, it's that daylight. It's getting that light in. So I'm glad you mentioned that. That's amazing. I'm glad you're talking about things besides you've mentioned the diet and exercise, but people hear so much about that, especially with the biohacking movement. And I'd love your take on that a little bit as well. So I'm really excited about all these other things that you're telling us, you know, the attitude, the kindness, the, getting that sunshine in the morning. That's that's wonderful because everyone knows that they're told all the time, you've got to sleep, you've got to eat health. We've heard so much of that. Let, let's talk about things that that we are overlooking. That kind yeah, of one really starting, got me. That's amazing. Sorry. No, no, um, go we ahead. We are starting to get more and more attention paid to the fact that social connections are yes. a huge, huge deal in terms of increasing our health span and increasing our brain span. In fact, Loneliness has been associated with being the same as smoking 15 exactly. cigarettes a day. 15 cigarettes a it's day, crazy. that's crazy. Mm-hmm. So yes, having some kind of social connect. I mean, even talking to you right now, even though it's just virtual, I mean, it, it's, it's just a connection. It's a, it's yeah, true. it's a connection. Mm-hmm. That's so, so important. That, I agree with you. Yeah. And it adds yeah, years to our life and health to our years, which is really important. Uh, a sense of purpose. Uh, one of the things that I was really surprised to hear is that studies have been done that show that having a sense of purpose can also add years to our life. Now, I found that amazing. By the way, it does not have to be like starting a new business. No. Or, yeah, it doesn't have to be a Huge. purpose with a big P. It can be a purpose with a small P. Walking the dog, taking care of your grandchildren. Uh, you know, anything that can make you feel like you have a good reason to get out of bed in the morning and take on life as we know it. So important. These are things that we kind of what we instinctively know, but because of the whole biomedical model and the very neurocentric approach, I believe, in the last 40 years, which you and I have seen both in as we've been in this field, it's taken people away from those very organic, natural things to wanting something external to put in all the time. That's you know, right. so it's, it's getting back to, you know, the kindness, the communication, the connection. That's amazing. So you, you actually emphasize the importance of intergenerational connections and the wisdom that comes from sharing experiences across age groups. And I read a really interesting study. And by the way, you keep mentioning studies that are some of my favorites. So I'm really enjoying this, but you, you talk about some wisdom that comes from sharing experiences across age groups. So how can we strong, uh, foster stronger connections between age groups? And and I just want to set the, the groundwork very quickly. I'm sure you saw the studies over COVID where there was the older generation with the technology and the young that weren't so efficient, but they handled depression more. The younger generation had the technology, but they were more depressed. And you know, if you can get the intergenerational, you could help each other. And so there were some, and there's so many, so many great studies like that. So I'd love you to talk about that. How can we foster this intergenerational connection? Yeah, this concept is beginning to drink, to gain some traction, which I really, really appreciate. The fact is that 
the, as you mentioned, older generation has some wisdom to, and maybe experience, and maybe they know their way around the workplace a little bit better than maybe a younger person might. Yet younger people have the expertise when it comes to tech and, and social media. Uh, just as an example, my daughter, she <laughs> comes home and she's in her 30s. I'm in my 70s. And I just feel like such a great connection, not only with her because she's my daughter, but she and her friends, I like to hang out with them. I'm going exactly. down to LA. Yeah, I'm going down to LA where she lives and I'm having dinner with a bunch of her friends. And what this fosters, they're always asking me questions about my ageless aging. Like, what's the recipe? Because even though they're only in their 30s, they want to know. They want to so get on the ageless aging train. But I want to know, like, how can I be better at social media? What could I be doing differently and without making myself go crazy? Because social media could, in fact, make you go crazy. Oh, absolutely. And all the different technology. So it's a matter of sharing skills instead of the, the almost the philosophy that's been happening a little bit where it's, oh, that, 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 what you spoke about, the attitude towards aging. Oh, they don't know anything. They, they're beyond it. They can't help anymore. The younger generation saying that. Meanwhile, there's the wisdom of the age. And us saying, oh gosh, that technology is just for the younger generation or whatever. It's actually crossing the skills and finding that, that boundary, isn't it? And sharing it our is, skills. It is. And do you ever have any experience intergenerationally that maybe would be a great example of that? Oh, absolutely. Well, I have four children and all four of them work with me. So, and they're all oh. in their late twenties and thirties. So three of, three of them full time, one part time. And I also hang out with all their friends and. You know, we sit in meetings, all my team are in their thirties to late twenties. So, and they're all brilliant with technology and we take, we're a tech mental health technology platform. So it's been wonderful being able to, to find that connection. And you, you, you see yourself as an older, older, and I don't, I don't see myself as old, but as the older in the team, giving the wisdom and the advice or whatever, seeing the big concepts and that kind of thing. And, but they're also willing to learn from them. They like, we learn from each other. So yes, it's been amazing. It, it's an openness. There's an openness to, hey, I can't do that, but I can do this from both sides. And how can we you know, bring this together? So that's been my personal experience. It's been amazing. Now, now I agree. So, um, you know, Chip Conley has created this word called mentor. The idea that you can mentor someone younger than you and then they can, in fact, mentor you right back. I love and that. I love it too. And I think that it's so true. Uh, the other thing I think that you're doing and I'm doing is we're great role models of what it could be when, as -hmm. you get older. I mean, how can you live your life in a way that in fact can be a little bit more ageless and uh, just developing the skill sets? And that definitely allays some of the fears that young people have about aging. They want to know, they want to get ahead of the curve. That's so true. I actually read an article this morning about how Gen X is very, uh, they're just not happy. And, you know, we've all, we've heard a lot of this. And I wonder if there's also this, you know, there's part of this is the fear of aging and thinking. I, I would love your take on, on that and linked to what you're doing in terms of ageless aging. Yeah. I think that it's really an interesting dynamic that's going on right now. Mm. The unhappiest generation right now in America are Gen Z. I mean, yes. the absolutely young. That's what I meant, Gen Z. I said Gen X by mistake. I mean, to say Gen Z, sorry. Well, that's okay. Gen X aren't that happy either. No, no that's I meant to say Gen Z. It's Gen Z. That was what I was, uh, Gen X kept well, popped out by are. mistake. They're, they were hit the hardest, yeah. I think, by COVID. And mm-hmm. uh, they haven't really bounced back. And I do think that there's this opportunity for us older adults to help them through it, to guide them, if you will, mm. give them some role models and also maybe show them a path where they might be happier. And I think the social media thing is definitely taking a toll on them. This idea that loneliness, it's really taken root in their lives in a way that is so very mm. sad. I'd love to see us all reach out to at least one or two Gen Zers that we know, maybe they're in our family, maybe they're just in our community, or maybe we reach out even further than that and let them know some of the ways that life has its ups and downs, but it does, in fact, have a lot of ups if you can open yourself up to it. And that's, I love that. So that's actually, I wanted to ask you, what would you, would be some practical ways of fostering 
the intergenerational gap, helping helping the Gen Gen Zers, and then also the the connection that you said in terms of ageless aging, connection is playing its kindness, etc. But connection was one of those things that. What are some practical strategies that you could suggest for building this connection thing? And then I'd love you to suggest some practical strategies for kindness. And I know that sounds so obvious, but sometimes we need to actually have a strategy in mind for how can I become kinder? How can I connect more with other people? So let me start with the first one. I think that there is an opportunity to create, which would be great for both generations, the older generations, you know, Gen X. Mm -hmm. And boomers together with Gen Z's and maybe even millennials because, you know, they're not having the best time of it either. Well, if we were to take, create generational, cross-generational dinners, reach out to people you know and maybe their children and maybe their grandchildren and create a eight or 10 person dinner and at them, just create the opportunity to interact. Just as an example, we were, the other night, my daughter was here visiting with, she has a dog who's been living with us. The dog's name is Joy. And she comes cute. and visits her once a month. That's and so cute. Well, she's so cute. She's a rescue. She's a tripod. And oh. so, by the way, that's a great way to get rid of some of your loneliness is to so, adopt hey. a cat. Exactly. But that's just a sidetrack here. <laughs> so we had my daughter here for dinner along with a couple of her friends. And after we ate dinner, we all made dinner together, which was great. That's lovely. It was. I mean, they showed me how to make something that I never knew how to make. And I showed them to make what we call my standard salmon. But everybody loves it. So it was great. But afterwards, we played a game that was really fun. It was like a get to know you better game, asking questions that were, some of them were really hard to answer because they delved pretty deeply into, you know, what are your biggest fears or what are you really looking forward to? What are your dreams? And in the beginning, we kind of gave answers that were on the superficial. On the surface, yeah. But after the second or third round, people started getting deep. And it was, you know, people were crying by the end of it. And it was such a revealing experience. And we all bonded so closely that night that you know, we want to get together again. So I, love I that. thought that was a great example of having like an intergenerational dinner and turning it into something a little bit more. That's so, amazing. I love that. Yeah, it was great. So one of the people I interviewed for my book, she was incredible. She was talking about kindness and she told me that she started something that at first she was like, oh, she was really angry about something. Yeah. She, was, she lives in New York City. She lives on the west side near Columbia University. She was a professor at Columbia University. And she was telling me how her street was filled with garbage and she really couldn't stand it. So finally she said, okay, instead of getting angry, I'm going to do something about it. So she went out and started picking up the garbage in front of her house. And in the process, she started meeting some of her neighbors and which was great. It made her feel better. But then they started chipping in and doing it as well. And so they started cleaning up their street, which moved into, oh, let's go grab brunch together. And so she really created this, not only act of kindness, but also the idea that we can actually build social connections through this kind of kindness. And I thought that was pretty cool. I love that because we're such an individualistic society in in the States. And we know that, and the, that sort of community type of the c- community focus is, is not there. It's like, and it's so natural to us, but it's so uh, the bigness and just the way the philosophy, the zeitgeist is so individual. So that's, that goes against the grain. Whereas somewhere like Africa or in Europe, it's so normal to just that's right. sit on that. You know, we were at, we were at dinner and um, went for, out for lunch for Easter Sunday. And we, we were just having, coming out of dinner and, and this, and this, this couple that we were, I think they were French. They, they, I think they were French. Yeah, they, they, and they just came up and started chatting to us because they'd seen me had gone to the same place and had gone afterwards to. I thought this is this doesn't happen much. If this was Americans, wouldn't have done been as connected. These people came up. We had this whole conversation because we'd been to the same place, but came out a different time. I mean, it's a silly example, but there was a bonding that happened 
that was a connection that I noticed that was different to just the person who was parking. They were just parking next to us. You, they, they actually connected. They made the effort to come over and chat. And, and it was great. It was three or four minutes that there was a connection that was made. And, and that was wonderful. Yeah, that's, that is great. And by the way, Kelly Harding, she was the Columbia University professor that I was just talking okay. about. She has a name for what you just said, and that is she called them micro kindnesses. And oh, that's a lovely. I love that idea that, you know, you can fill your day with micro kindnesses and that they add up to increasing Macro. your health span and your brain span even. Because, wow. you know, it activates different parts of your brain when yeah. you do, mm -hmm. in fact, give kindness to other people. To That's other amazing. People. I Which love that. Yourself, by the way, I think providing some yeah. kindness to yourself, we're pretty hard on ourselves. Oh, Let's my gosh. Way it. too hard. Yeah. So we could be a little kinder to ourselves. Can, can you give an example of that? Because I know that's very much around in social media, be kind to yourself. But what does that look like from an ageless aging perspective? What could you, could you give an example of that? Yeah, I could give a few examples. One is when Wonderful. you wake up in the morning and after you get your circadian rhythms going, right, taking in the sunrise and maybe doing five or 10 minutes of stretching or yoga. Now look yourself in the mirror and remind yourself how amazing you are. I mean, how it's taken a lot of energy to get to where you are in life and that what, you know, find three things that you feel really good about yourself and, and tell yourself, say it verbally out loud and it will help set up your day. And I would add, then set maybe three goals for what you want to accomplish for the day, setting up your purpose. And again, doesn't have to be like, you know, conquering Major. the world. It can yeah. be like, calling my son and making sure that he's having a great day. I mean, it can be small thing. And the idea is that these things can work together, the kindness, together with the purpose, together with the social connection to create a more ageless kind of aging. So I think that that is definitely something we can all do. The other thing is, is that a way to be kind to yourself is to recognize that when you wake up in the morning and after you do these things, you know, instead of just going and eating a donut or having some sugar-based cereal for breakfast, and by the way, Dr. Walter Longo said that after you spend 12 to 13 hours not eating anything, so you're intermittent fasting, he thought breakfast was the most important meal of the day. So yep. that's pretty counter to what you would expect. Anyway, know, yeah. eat something healthy, you know, put something, start with maybe some warm water with lemon to just get your gut juices going. And then, you know, maybe it's just having, I'm not a big breakfast eater myself. I, I It's hard for me to eat breakfast, but, you know, if I can't eat, I'll just have an apple with some kind of almond butter. Or I found this like incredible nut butter that's a combination, it's called everything butter. Oh, I know, I it, yeah. It. It's just got so many different nuts and seeds in it. So, you know, I can just start there. Something, but yeah. Something healthy. I mean, do something good for yourself every day. Get out there and exercise. And if you can, do it in the morning because it really doubles the impact by doing it early in the day. And I think this being kind to ourselves is a really important really thing. And, you know, in Ageless Aging, I talk about a variety of different hacks you can do to, in fact, be a little kinder. Can you give us a, a one that you haven't covered? Can you give us another hack that you haven't covered? I'm just trying to see what else I want. I don't want to miss out on all the great things you've... <laughs> yes. I think yeah, we've I covered think... You, most of what I've wanted to ask you. You've been actually covered, but no. you said that you give a lot of great hacks. So can you give us a... just? Let's just round off this podcast with giving us... A, everyone loves a, a good hack. Actually, let's do this. I'd love you to give us a couple of hacks. And then I'd also love you just to comment on the biohacking industry as it stands, because it really is an industry and just maybe put it in a little bit of perspective for people. So it's two parts to the question. Okay. Let me start with the second one. Okay. Sounds good. So biohacking. First of all, I think it's cool. I love it. I think it's a great concept. If you can find, sh I think of them as shortcuts or yeah. you know, tips and techniques that we can all integrate into our lives that make it a little bit easier to live better longer. And yeah, that's a great thing. But 
most of the books on longevity written by biohackers, many of whom I have such great respect for. Absolutely. Uh, you know, I really do. I think they're doing a great job and a great service, but not all of those hacks work for women. And I think we women mm. need to understand that. And again, that's part of why I wrote Ageless Aging for women. I want women to get the shortcuts that work well for them. Okay, so, so let's talk about some of in your hacks. Let's talk about maybe three or four of the shortcuts that work for women that work for men and vice versa. So something okay, like that. So that brings us directly into the line of fire of hormones. I think hormones is a huge deal. Actually, there's two things I'd like to focus on. Hormones sure. and brain health. And okay. of course, brain health is like right in your sweet spot. And hormones but, too. So. Oh, good. Great. So as you know, there's been a lot of misinformation out there about hormones and hormone replacement. And I love the fact that a lot of Gen Xers in particular, they're taking this whole issue of menopause and they're breathing fresh air into it. And I think that women of my generation, we didn't talk about it. We mm. might have taken action, but we didn't talk about it. So I think as basic as it may seem, opening up the conversation on hormones is a very important step because many gynecologists are still very well-meaning, probably great doctors, but they're still relying on a study that was done back in the early 2000s yeah. that gave a lot of misinformation. It was a flawed study. Absolutely. It, it encouraged women to not take part in hormone replacement. And the newest science, the newest information mm -hmm. that menopause specialists talk about is in fact doing bioidentical hormone yeah. replacement. And of course, it's important that it's bioidentical. Absolutely. You don't want to use artificial or from horses urine or some crazy exactly. thing like that. So, which is, was part of the flawed study. They exactly. didn't in fact use those kinds of things. So yes, I would encourage, now this is where it gets controversial. Hormone replacement is not for everyone because mm -hmm. if you have, as you know so well, any kind of like if you have breast cancer in your family or if you have ovarian cancer or cervical cancer in your family, you're going to think twice about it. And when I spoke with Dr. Carol Kuhl, who is a menopause specialist and head of the Women's Health Clinic, I think, I think yeah. it is yeah. the Women's Health Clinic so, yeah. at Mayo Clinic, at Mayo Clinic. Uh, and I wrote my book with Mayo Clinic Press. So they gave me great access to Dr. Cool, who was incredible. It's wonderful. Anyway, she told me that there are things that women who have breast or ovarian or cervical cancer can do because it's not about the estrogen, it's about the progesterone that's the problem. And mm -hmm. so eliminate the progesterone and there's other things you can do. Like for instance, I know this sounds crazy, but the Marina IUD can be a replacement yeah. for progesterone and is safely used with estrogen for hormone replacement for women who have these issues. So you know, my suggestion would be, you know, go to your doctor, go to your yeah. gynecologist, but also make sure that they understand menopause. Yeah. Not all ob gynies. I mean, no. the OB part of it is pretty obvious. Not yeah. all of them have the expertise in menopause. Bioidentical. Yeah. And the bioidentical hormone replacement. I can't agree with you more. I've been doing it for years as well. And I agree with you. Me it's too. Really <laughs> makes a difference. Huge difference. But as each, as you say, we're not using it as a blanket solution. We are saying to people, be aware and find out and work with your doctor. And there are different combinations. And I'm glad you mentioned about the Mirena. That's, you know, that's uh, excellent different ways of, and that the progesterone potentially could be an issue. So thanks for bringing those up. And then you had one more. We've got yeah, time the brain for you health to, issue. Yeah. I think that one of the best things, I know this sounds simplistic. First of all, brain health is a much bigger issue for women than men. And I have it running in my family. Yeah. I was scared to death up until about three or four years ago because everyone told me that it's all about your genetics. So forget no, it. Definitely not, not the case anymore. Mm -hmm. And Thank God for that. We can do yeah. things. New study came out literally last week 
that told us that there, there are three harmful things that make it much more likely that you will get Alzheimer's disease than all the other potential ingredients combined. Mm-hmm. And those things are diabetes. Mm-hmm. And they did not in this study differentiate wow. between type 1 and type 2, which I was okay. really surprised about. Yeah. But I would say type 2, putting in my yeah. own sense. Second was air pollution. So to really be careful, keep your, especially your interior environment clean, get air filters. I mean, do mm. simple things like that can make a huge, huge difference. And the last one, I think a lot of people are not going to be happy to hear about. And that is alcohol consumption that, you know, it is in fact toxic and mm. that to certainly limit it to one five ounce glass of wine or alcohol a day. And if you do drink the hard alcohol, not to add a sugary something to it, just have it with soda or something like a club mm-hmm. soda type soda. Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, that's fantastic advice. Well, thank you so much for writing the book and for sharing your wisdom. And you are filled with wisdom. It's so obvious. So thank you for sharing that. And I'm very excited for people to get their hands on this book. So where can they, I know they can get books wherever books are sold, but how can they find out more about you? Do you have a website? Do you have a social uh, social media platform? Social media, Maddie Dykewald is my handle on all social media. Perfect. And I have a website, MaddieDykewald.com. And on the website, if you go there and buy the book over there, we're actually offering some great gifts to go along with it, some deeper information on brain health and also on financial health, which by the way, the way our finances impact our age of aging is pretty Huge. dramatic. So yeah. Oh, that's fascinating. Well, thank you so much for sharing that. And I encourage everyone to get the book because age, age is aging begins not when you're old, begins when you're young, the younger, Perfect. the better. Thank you so much for joining us today. Oh, thank you. It's been a pleasure. It's been a pleasure. Thank you.